Well, I graduated from college in 1978 with a degree in psychology and no idea what I wanted to do with my wife. Well, I had some vague ideas about maybe coaching or being a guidance counselor in school of some kind, but the key word there is vague, really pretty vague. So I went to Europe for a, almost a whole year to play basketball in Switzerland. That's a long story in and of itself. And while I was there, uh, I received uh, what I believed to be a personal call to ministry, which is a story I'll tell in detail sometime. Came home after that time uh, determined to prepare myself for what I believe God was calling me to. And that is a life in ministry. Didn't know much about it, but I believe I had a call. So I contacted Taylor University in Indiana to see if I could take a second undergrad degree there in biblical literature. My parents had gone there. I had a brother who just transferred there. And so I wanted to take some Bible. I hadn't had that in my undergrad. So I went, ended up doing that while I helped coach basketball at Taylor University. Two years later, I had my Bible degree and still no clear vision about what God wanted me to do with my life. So I then began another degree, a master's degree in counseling psychology at Ball State University right up the road, again hoping to prepare myself for some aspect of ministry. And somewhere during that second two-year period, and now I'm at about the four-year mark, I became frustrated with how slowly it seemed to me that God was putting my life together. You ever felt that way? I mean, I felt like I was doing my part to prepare, you know, and I needed Him to do His part. I felt like I was doing all the heavy, heavy lifting while he was sort of leaning on his shovel, watching me do all the work. Now, of course, I found out later that it was really quite the other way around. At some point in that process, I wrote my dad a letter, an old-fashioned kind of letter, the kind of, you have a stamp on there that we hardly ever do anymore. And somewhere I must have shared some of my frustrations with him. <clears throat> and he wrote me back, and I still somewhere have this letter. In addition to some generally encouraging comments, he wrote this. I still remember it word for word. He wrote, it took Jesus... 30 years to prepare for three years of ministry. What makes you think you can do it any faster, he said. In other words, preparation is important. Be patient. Our year-long preaching theme is the story of Jesus. And last week we finished, as the video uh, reminded you, a three-week mini-series called Anticipation, in which we look backward into the prequel of the Bible story of Jesus. The prequel is the Old Testament, the prophets who foresaw, who anticipated God doing this unique thing and sending Jesus into the world. And now we begin another series, which will be five weeks in length, called Preparation. Now, by the way, let me encourage you right at this point to really think about joining the book club this fall. Uh, we uh, have, are starting this thing again called the All-Time Bestseller Book Club. It's a, it's a reading program through the New Testament. Uh, we have created our own version of the New Testament, which is just a kind of a condensed version of the gospel story of Jesus. It's all scripture, but it's been condensed. No repeat stories, no chapter breaks. Moves right through. We're doing it in 10 weeks as a church family. We already have over 1,000 people signed up to do it, registered with their books. So if you want to jump in, just check back the kiosk. Check by the kiosk after service tonight. You can get registered. The books are free. You can do it as a couple, as an individual, as a family. You can jump into a small group. Uh, it's a great chance to study along with us the story of Jesus. We're going to jump into the story in Luke chapter 2, and you're going to notice that we, we're jumping over the, the birth narrative, the story of Jesus' birth. We're going to come back and do that kind of out of order. We do it, do it at uh, Advent season, at Christmas time. It just seemed to us to make sense to do it that way. So Luke chapter 2, I'm going to pick up the story in verse 41, and uh, the story will sort of unfold before us. Luke chapter 2. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. Let me pause there. The feast of Passover um, was followed immediately by something called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that week-long celebration, beginning with Passover and on into the following week, is just one of the high celebration points of the entire Jewish year. It's the remembrance of uh, the exodus from Egypt, in particular on Passover night. The feast recalls the time when the Israelites put the blood of a lamb over the door frames of their homes so that as the angel of God brought judgment on Egypt, uh, the angel would pass over their homes, thus the name Passover as they escaped uh, from Egypt. Now Passover is also significant in that it's the backdrop uh, to several very key moments in the story of Jesus. One of them being the very last week of his life, which we'll get to in a few months, which takes place during the Passover celebration as well. Now notice the very small word up in this passage. Luke starts by saying they went up according 
to customs. Now, until uh, my wife and I and Jeff and his wife traveled to Israel this past spring, I would have skipped completely over that small word up. I would have just blipped over it and not paid attention to it. But once you visit, you can see why that word up is there. Take a look at this photo of Jerusalem. Luke says they went up because Jerusalem is actually located at elevation uh, geographically. It's 2,500 feet above sea level. Uh, The city of Jericho, which is just 17 miles north of Jerusalem, which would have been the last stopping place on a journey between Nazareth, Jesus' hometown, and Jerusalem, Jericho was located at 1,200 feet below sea level. So the journey to the great city uh, was always uphill. In fact, it was a, was a fairly steep climb over those, those miles. So whenever the Gospels say they went up, they're going toward Jerusalem. Whenever, whenever they're going away from Jerusalem, it says they're going down. Just something to keep in mind. It has geological, uh, geographical significance. Now, Jerusalem is also the very center of the nation, the spiritual center of the nation. So since the Passover feast was one of the three what are called pilgrim festivals. That is, um, there were three great celebrations in the Jewish year that, that were all Jewish men were required by religious law to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And often they would bring their families and extended families with them. This is one of those times. Therefore, that's why Luke says, and so his parents went up according to custom every year. It's what everybody did. It's what you were supposed to do in the Jewish world. Let's pick up the rest of the story beginning in verse 43. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, this is such a beautiful story. Just filled with uh, cultural and theological meaning. Uh, I'm going to try to pull out just a couple of things for us uh, today that we can learn from and grow from. First, we see in this story that Jesus had a family. Jesus had a family. A number of years ago... Uh, when we had just three sons, number four had not come along yet, I think they were aged something like six and four and one, and I had all three of them with me on a trip to a local mall, so I had it my hands full. Uh, as I recall, I was pushing the very youngest in a stroller because he couldn't really get around well yet, and the other two were walking along with me. And in this mall, I forget what I was even looking for, but I went into, I think, a sporting goods store uh, and was, got caught, got kind of stuck looking at important things like sneakers or something, looking at stuff, had the stroller with me, and the other two boys were kind of looking at their stuff because they were six and four walking around. And after I was done looking at whatever I was looking at, I went to leave, and I only had two-thirds of the children I arrived with. One of them, the middle one, was not there. The oldest one was there. I had the stroller, and the middle one was gone. So I oh, well, I, he just must have been in the next aisle over. So I walked to the next aisle over, same store, and he wasn't there. Go to the next aisle, he wasn't there. He wasn't in any aisles. In fact, he wasn't in that store at all. And if you are a parent or have been a parent, you know what starts to happen next. You start to get a little bit anxious. So I went outside the store and looked down the hallway, the whole mall. I couldn't see him there, couldn't see him there. So now I'm really starting to get nervous. Where did he go? How far could he get? How long was I looking at the shoes? I had no idea. And so I I start going, I I start to develop a strategy. I'm going to go to the next store and the next store. I'll go to every store in the whole mall because I'm going to find my son, right? And so I go to the next one, the next one. And I've got two stores down, now really starting to get nervous. I'm pushing the stroller, dragging the other child. I I didn't care that it looked funny. I didn't care what it looked like. I didn't care how many stores I went to. I didn't care if I had the knockover rows of, of clothes because I had to find my son because I loved my son. He was lost. Well, I got about two stores down, and this kind security guy comes walking out of a store, holding my son's hand, sees me, can tell what I'm looking for, and just goes, hey, 
you looking for this little guy? Smiling, and he was there. No, and I thanked him, and, and was a little bit embarrassed because I lost one of, out of the three. Um, but I, I, I was happy. I was glad. Now, I'm sure somewhere in there as we walked away, I said to the son who had walked away, you can't do that. I have to know where you are. Don't do that to me again, right? I love this little story in Luke because it's such a human family story. And when the feast was ended and they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Now, Luke has told us Jesus now is 12 years old. But this would be the equivalent in our culture of being somewhere around 18 years old. It was the age in the Jewish culture where a boy became a man. It was the age of the bar mitzvah uh, that symbolized the passageway from boyhood to manhood. We actually got to see this in, back in Jerusalem on a couple of occasions. Uh, fathers with other male members of the family uh, will take the boy to what's called the Western Wall. Of, uh, it's the outer wall of the Temple Mount. And after some parading, some singing, some dancing... The boy will carry, and that blue thing he's carrying is a fancy uh, copy of the Torah, the scrolls of the Old Testament. And they'll get to a certain location, and the boy gets to read publicly, out loud, from God's Word for the first time. That's the celebration of moving from a boy to a man. Now, we aren't sure, but we actually think it's very possible that one of the purposes of this trip to Jerusalem when Jesus was 12 the oldest in his family, was not just for Passover, but was also to celebrate his own bar mitzvah because it was time. He was 12. He was ready to become a man. Luke says his parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. This is when they're on the way home down to Nazareth, which is about a 70-mile journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances, and when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem searching for him. Now, try to imagine the scene. This is probably a whole extended family. There's aunts, uncles, cousins, uh, don't know how many on the way. They go all the way to Jerusalem, spend a week, and now they're heading home. It's a long journey. The first day journey would probably be from Jerusalem to Jericho. And I don't know how you travel, but when we have a chance to travel with an extended family, maybe for a vacation or something, we will often just jumble up the cousins in vans, right? They like they haven't seen each other for a while. They'll jump in the other van, and so we'll drive separately with cousins from mixed families all together. I think that's what was happening here. When they left Jerusalem, oh, can I ride with cousin so-and-so? Can I ride? And they all walked in different groupings, all spread all along the road. And so it would be normal not to see each other in the same family for an hour, hours or so. But when you get to the destination, dinner time, hotel, whatever, you regroup. And after a day of traveling, like driving from here to Minneapolis, they get to Minneapolis and they realize, where's Jesus? I thought you had him. No, you said you had him. I thought he was with so. Where is he? And they realize he's not with anybody. He's back in Jerusalem, a whole day's journey away. Have you ever left a child somewhere? We have stories about leaving one at church, leaving one at Adventure Club, and, you know, it happens sometimes. Have you ever thought you've lost a child? How about for three days? This isn't a couple hours. This isn't in a mall. This is three days. What do you think mom and dad are feeling right about now? Frustration? Maybe anger? Yeah. With the child, with each other's fear? Even terror? What's happening? Look what Luke says. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. Now, the word translated into English here, astonished, is a very interesting word in Greek. And it's almost impossible to translate with a single word into English. In fact, if you look at different translations, they all choose different words here. Astonished, amazed, shocked. Because the word means all of those things and more. I did a little research here, and the word is a Greek word that comes from the root of verb, expleso, which means, uh, some writers say it means to strike out with panic, to be thunderstruck, to strike out of one's senses. We might say it in the way we talk, they were panicked out of their minds. That's the word. Or they were beside themselves with both panic and joy. I think only a parent knows how those two emotions can be present at the same exact time. Panic and joy. This is a human family. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. Also, lousy way to translate what's happening here. I think we'd say it this way. What were you thinking? 
How could you do this to us? We've been worried sick about you. Right? That's what you would say. Three days. Now, a couple things we notice here. First, Jesus grew up in a real human family. So easy just to miss this part of the story. He grew up with a mother and a father, technically an adoptive father, more on that in just a little bit, and with siblings, quite likely four or five brothers and sisters we find out later in the New Testament. A family that went through meal times and bedtimes and family trips to Jerusalem. Are we there yet? Are we there here yet? How much farther? How much farther? Even losing track of a child. In fact, you can make the argument that the Gospels are silent on Jesus' life from the birth narrative, which we'll get to in December, uh, all the way until he's 12, roughly a 10-year period, silent, not a single story, because it was a normal human family. Nothing happened in those 10 years that was extraordinary. They were raising a boy into manhood, just a family. Secondly, we notice that Jesus was once a real adolescent boy. An adolescent young man. Like any adolescent, the 12-year-old Jesus is teetering between dependence on his parents and stepping out into independence. He's moving between boyhood and manhood. He's figuring out his identity. He's figuring out who he is. He makes a decision to stay behind in Jerusalem, and he makes it intentionally, we find out, and he doesn't regard it as significant to tell his mother and father. More on that in just a minute. Thirdly, we see that Jesus has a unique relationship with his mother. Notice, while Joseph is mentioned in the story, Joseph never speaks in the story. He's never given any lines. It's Mary who blurts out, why have you treated us this way? Maybe because Joseph had confidence in his son. Maybe because Joseph was the one whispering to his wife, don't worry, Mary, don't worry. He's a big boy. He knows how to take care of himself. He'll be fine. Maybe it's just the way mothers are. You know, isn't it true that a mother's heart is never far from her children? Isn't that true? No matter how old your children are, a mother's heart is never far away. I remember a time when I was in college. I just went through a breakup uh, with a girlfriend. Actually, she broke up with me. Um, and I didn't really want to talk to my parents about it. It had just happened. But I used to call home every Sunday night. So I hadn't told them anything about it. I call home. My mother picks up the phone. I said, hi, Mom. She goes, what's wrong? She could tell in two words, even when I was trying to hide it, something was wrong. Because a mother's heart's never far from her children. We see a hint of this in verse 51 in the same passage. And Mary and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Jesus had a family. We need to see that in the story. Secondly, we see that Jesus also had a passion. He had a passion. When I was about 11 years old... uh, My family lived in a parsonage. That was a fancy word they used to give to the home that a pastor lives in. But our parsonage was actually actually attached to the church uh, where my father was the pastor. It was a small building. Our living area was connected to the sanctuary through a a hallway and then my father's office. And then there was the sanctuary. And we lived on one side. The church was on the other side. And I've told this particular story many times. It's one of my favorite stories of growing up. We were sometimes uh, allowed, my brothers and I, to play in the church side of things when nothing was going on. We had a big area to play. We'd run around and do all kinds of things. But if there was church going on or a meeting going on, or if my dad's office door was closed, we weren't allowed to go through there because he was working. So we had to stay on our side. Well, one day, one thing led to another, running around playing tag or something. And even though his door was shut, for some reason I thought he wasn't in there. So I burst through the door. And he was in there in a counseling appointment with a person from, our congrega- from the congregation. I burst in. He looks at me. I look at him. I thought, oops, I, I'm in trouble. And before I could back out, he goes, and I walked around to his side of the desk. And he said, he turned me around and he said, this is my son, oldest son, Brian. Uh, he introduced me. And then he looked at me and he said, what can I do for you? And I realized, I'm not in trouble. And then I thought, Cool. I have a unique access because that's just my dad. And he, there was a way he communicated to me, I'm your father, you have access to me. We have a unique relationship. We see this in here in this story. Jesus had a unique relationship with his father, capital F. Notice, Luke says, and, when he, and he said to them, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? What an interesting thing for a young boy to say. What an interesting thing for him to say to his parents. Almost a rebuke. 
Like, his mother has said, well, how could you do this to us? And he says, why, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know any better? It's almost like he rebukes them. And when he refers to my father's house, he's not talking about Joseph's house in Nazareth, the house he grew up in. He's talking about where he is at the moment that is the great temple of David in Jerusalem. So when he says my father, he's saying something very significant about his relationship with God the Father. Now many have asked the question, when did Jesus know who he was? How does a boy young man come to believe that he is the son of God? How, how can you even wrap your mind around what he has to understand about himself? Well, did he always know? Or did he grow into that knowledge? It's a, it's a great question. We don't really know, but there are two leading moments of t- in time that are great candidates. One is his baptism, which Jeff will uh, talk to you about uh, as part of this series, when He comes up out of the water and the voice says, this is my beloved son. The other is right here at age 12. That's because Jesus, we see here that Jesus had a unique passion for his father's house. He says, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? That phrase, I must be, is an imperative in the strongest sense. It means, did you not know that I had to be? that I had to do this, that I was compelled to be here with everything in me. He's saying that I have a unique passion that you don't understand. I have a unique calling that you don't understand. I'm being prepared for something you don't yet understand. That's why I'm here. It's probably true at this point in his life, Jesus had already begun to apprentice with his father Joseph as a tecton. In Greek, it can be translated carpenter or as a builder. He had already begun to learn the trade of his father. But he says, I must be in my father's house, capital F, saying I'm being prepared for a different career than you think. That's why I'm here. For the temple of God was a place of worship where sacrifices were offered. Who would Jesus become? The final sacrifice, the Lamb of God. The temple was a place for prayer. Prayer plays a huge part in Jesus' life and ministry. The temple was the presence of God with his people. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is saying that from this point forward in his life, he will be driven by his unique relationship with God the Father and by his passion for his Father's house. We're going to see this passion in action in a few weeks when we study the story of Jesus cleansing the temple from the money changers. So Jesus had a family, and Jesus had a passion. And thirdly, we see in this beautiful story that Jesus grew in every way. Jesus grew in every way. We have a door frame in our home where we have measured the uh, physical height of our sons as they've gotten older. And periodically as they grew up, we would stand them up against the wall, put a book on their heads, make a little mark, and then use the tape measure and carefully record the height of that particular boy right down to the quarter of an inch because every quarter of an inch mattered in our house, right? I think you can understand. And when we look back at the marks on the door frame, you can see points of time where the physical growth was quite dramatic, up to three, three and a half inches in a year sometimes. And then you see times where the lines get closer together, the growth begins to slow down, and eventually the physical growth stops. And the truth for a lot of us is it starts to go backward a little bit, start to shrink a little bit. That's my excuse for, um, I, used to, I tell my boys I used to be much taller when I was younger, much taller. Here Luke is talking about more than physical growth. We know that every parent loves to see physical growth. And when a child doesn't grow at a certain rate, it's cause for great concern. But Luke's talking about more than physical growth here. He says, and Jesus increased, that is, he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Touches on four dimensions of growth at the same time. Stature is there, that's physical height. Jesus grew like any other boy would grow. But he also says he increased in wisdom and in favor with God and men. Let's take a look at these. Wisdom. Wisdom is intellectual growth, knowledge of God's law, as well as growing in the wisdom of applying God's law, God's word, to life. As a Jewish boy, Jesus would have been expected to study and learn God's law, the Torah. The first five books of the Old Testament as we would see them. Perhaps even to memorize huge portions of Scripture and the prophets and the Psalms and so forth. 
Growing up in Nazareth, a typical small town, he would have been sent, uh, would have been exposed to early religious education, we would call it. When he was four or five years old, he would have gone to what's called the Bet Safer, the house of the book. Then at age eight to ten, he would have gone to Bet Midrash, the house of study. But that's probably where his formal education stopped because to take the next step, which was called the Bet Talmud, he would be sent away to a bigger city to basically enter rabbinical school. And Jesus was never sent away because he's still living in Nazareth at 12, traveling to Jerusalem. And this is significant because it helps us understand what happens in the temple. It says, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and answers. Why were they amazed? There were other 12-year-old boys there too. That was a, it was like a class. And he was sort of auditing a class. It was going on. He stayed behind. He walked in. He sat down and he began to listen. And he, but he was an outsider. He wasn't in that part of school. He was from a small town called Nazareth. And yet he understood. He understood more than many of his peers. In fact, he was instructing some of the teachers. He was a young boy of extraordinary wisdom because he had a passion for his father's house. Secondly, he grew also in favor with God and men. Now this word favor is the Greek word charity, which is the same word we get grace from. It means to grow in favor with men is to grow in the grace of relationship with others. In short, Jesus was good with people. He was good with people. People liked being around him. They loved being with him. And he loved people. He grew in favor with men. He also grew in favor with God. In the grace of of relationship with God, his Father. This is the spiritual dimension of his life. But I think the key word here for us tonight is grew. He increased. Jesus had to grow. This is significant because we make two main historical or theological mistakes when we think about Jesus. Throughout history, there have been two main mistakes. Heresies, actually. One is that, one is that Jesus was only human, that he was just a man. Now, this heresy has been around since the first century, and it still today is the most common misunderstanding, the most common mistake that people in our culture make about Jesus, that Jesus was a great man, a great spiritual teacher, chosen best, blessed by God, but only a man like other great men, Buddha, Muhammad, etc. The second mistake we make is that Jesus was God, but that he was never really human. Centuries ago, this was called the Docetic Heresy, uh, and I actually, it's where ph philosophers began it thinking that all flesh and matter are evil, therefore God, being perfect, would never take on flesh because flesh is dirty and evil and sinful, so God would never really become incarnate. Jesus only appeared to be human. Now, we would say, of course we don't believe that, but let me hold on for a second. Isn't it true that sometimes we're guilty of this particular heresy? That is, we tend to think of Jesus as sort of a Bible superhero. You know, we don't really think as a boy he had to be potty trained. Not really. We don't really think he had to learn table manners. We don't really think he ever stuck his head in his bowl and lapped up his food like a dog would. I can't, I, you can probably guess where I got that illustration. We don't really think he was human. He was Jesus, Bible guy, Bible hero. He didn't have to learn scriptures the way we do. He didn't have to study and learn. It was just sort of magic for him. And when we take that view, we are taking a, a heretical view of who Jesus was. Jesus was fully human and fully God. That's why Luke tells us this story at this time. And Jesus had to grow. Grew up in a family. He had to grow physically. He had to grow spiritually. He had to grow relationally. Notice that he, after this happened with his parents... He started to tell them who he was. They didn't fully understand, but he submitted to them in obedience and went home to Nazareth. Even when he didn't have to, he did. He learned obedience. He grew relationally. He grew in favor. Why did he have to grow? Why did Jesus need to grow in all these ways? Because when he discovered who he was, However that happened, whenever that happened, when he knew his identity as the Son of God, he had to be prepared, fully prepared, for what God was calling him to do for his life and ministry. Now, there are two takeaways today. First, 
For those of us who are parents or who maybe will be parents someday, we need to see that our great responsibility and opportunity is to parent, raise children so that they will grow in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and men. That they will be well prepared for the life that God calls them to. It's our responsibility. Jesus grew up in a real family, and his family helped prepare him by allowing for and encouraging his growth in all these dimensions. We like to call this faith at home because we believe that the Bible teaches the primary responsibility for the growth of children across all four dimensions of life, physical, intellectual, spiritual, and social, lies in the home. The church comes alongside and helps, but that responsibility lies in the home. Second, and this is for all of us, we are all expected to grow. We all need to increase because we're all being prepared for what God has for us. If Jesus, the eternal and incarnate Son of God, needed to grow, needed to increase in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and men, if Jesus needed to be prepared, how much more do we also need to grow, to increase in all of these dimensions, so that we will be prepared to live the life that God has called us to live. When an infant is born and does not gain weight, according to um, uh, what is regarded as a normal rate, when a child does not grow developmentally or physically in certain predictable ways that physicians will look at, that condition is called failure to thrive. And it's very, very serious. It must be treated very quickly and seriously to enable that child to return to a healthy rate of growth. That's true. So here's a few questions as we wrap up. First, how's your growth rate right now, personally? What do the marks look like on your personal spiritual wall? the doorframe of your spiritual life? Are you growing in wisdom that is knowledge and understanding of God's word? This is a great time of year to jump into one of the programs that allow you to grow, to jumpstart your growth, whether it be the all-time bestseller book club or a women's Bible study that are getting ready to launch or a team that's getting ready to launch on Friday morning for men. Find a way to begin to grow in your knowledge of God's word. Are you growing in favor with God? in the grace of relationship with him, through worship and prayer, intimacy with your Father in heaven, or have you grown stagnant, failure to thrive? Are you growing in favor with men? How are your relationships, your key relationships, growing or failing to thrive? The story of Jesus begins with preparation. That's what this story is about. Preparation. God the Father preparing his Son for the challenges of the life and ministry to which he will be called. Back to my father's letter 35 years ago. Jesus took 30 years to prepare for three years of public ministry. What makes the, you think you can do it any faster? Preparation, this is the story of Jesus. Bow with me in prayer, will you? Lord God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for this beautiful little story that comes to us through Luke's gospel. A story of a real family, a story of real relationships, and the story of Jesus who grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. Lord, I thank you for our families. Families, as we know, come in all shapes and sizes with all kinds of imperfections. But we thank you for families. Help our families, our homes to be places of growth and places of preparation. And may your spirit working in each one of our hearts be that which causes us to increase in our passion for your house, in our passion for your word, and in our passion for relationship with you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.